Guys and gals and pals, what's that? You're melting? You're on fire? It has nothing to do with this heat wave. As the video indicated, in this tournament, it's every person for themselves. No one will give you a save. The fire, the desire, it's all about the present, not the moment prior. Many of these matches have gone down to the wire. Each and every week, the bar gets higher and higher. The mundane and ordinary can try and conspire. But this is the land of innovation. I know, I know, I'm preaching to the choir. We keep it real because that's in our DNA. Like Jim Carrey in the second half of Liar Liar. We educate, pontificate, and entertain like a microphone in the hands of one Richard Pryor. These rhymes done? Nope. Sorry, not sorry. Just getting started. In this grand debate celebrity tournament, some have advanced while others have departed. With 13,000 on the line, guys and gals, a trip for two to Greece, and the right to become Mr., Mrs., or Miss TKN, there is so much on the line. It begins with the great debate champ, the odds-on favorite. Yup, Eric Heron. That man can shine. Hall of Famers Rick Barry, Jim McMahon, JBL, Mark Henry, and Gerald Briscoe can all go all the way and break your spine. How about Brian Blair, Stephen Tobolowsky, Pete Babcock? They're more informative than a C-SPAN broadcast hosted by Ben Stein. Stephen Tobolowsky and Jim Brunzel, their vast array of knowledge, they age like fine wine. Jeremy London, Eddie Johnson, they have it all. In fact, they're researching Greece already, as they call the airline. Giselle and Pete, what a treat. There are no underdogs here. There is no challenge that they will decline. Fred Ottman and Buff Bagwell have a bark as big as their bite, like James Belushi, partner in K-9. But this mountain will be climbed by a man named Avi Klein. I will never resign. Howard Collado and Cara J bring the numbers every time they headline. But what of the other five or six mystery competitors? In this tournament, we have over 10 Hall of Famers, legends, champions, and award winners. Oh, my. In this single elimination tournament, it's one loss and you're out. We call it do or die. And on this incredible and innovative network known as TKN, there are already 60-plus shows with even more Oscar, Grammy, Emmy, and Tony Award winners, Hall of Famers, Legends. We ain't changing the game. We've created our console. Chew on that. In this tournament, where else can so many luminaries and up-and-comers compete for one singular goal? They each bring a flavor or a distinct quality, like a third person speaking like Bob Dole, a Robert De Niro mole, a Diego Maradona goal. Lane Stanley, belting out the lyrics to Down in a Hole. A shot blocked by 7'7 seven seven Manute Bowl. A pissed off Freddy Krueger stealing your soul. Or ladies, an Avi Klein kiss that is sure to make you whole. You know it to be true, don't you? But enough! It's now about these three competitors with only a few spots left. They each want to advance to round two. Our first competitor brings the facts. He doesn't need to buy a vowel or even a clue. He's intelligent, talented, and what of a kind. His work ethic is incredible. He most definitely doesn't fear the grind. His vast array of knowledge might indeed be a plus when it's all said and done. His future begins tonight. Will he strike out or hit a glorious home run? His opponents are the cream of the crop, so I hope that he's ready to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Let's give it up to Mr. Voiceover himself, first name Joe, last name Rositano. Hey, welcome, Bobby. Celebrity. Thank you. Grand debate yes. tournament, round number one. <sighs> I am pumped and excited to be on the Grand Debate. Finally, it has been a long time coming, but here I am and thankful for everybody watching and all of you that makes this engine go. This is the time and I am ready. Absolutely, guys and gals. This is Joe Ricitano, co-host of The VoiceOvers. 60 plus shows. Remember, guys, we are now streaming on 53 pages on Facebook. 53, not to mention our YouTube channel, our new network Facebook page, and of course, guys and gals, my personal page and the pages of my co-hosts. And guys, as you know, we are also dealing right now with something brand new that we've never unveiled before. We're going to do that. A fatal four-way next Saturday night. Four mystery competitors. Who knows who they are? And guys, once again, we started with a big donut a couple years ago. Now, seven-figure views on 53 pages, not including my own. That's what we do here. When you total everything up, you guys are the engine that makes this thing go. And if you want more content, all you got to do is visit www.thenewnetwork.com. That's www.thekneweditwrk.com. Who knew? We know, and so do you. So... With that, Joe Satano, are you ready for your next opponent, my friend? I am ready. Thank you, Avi. Guys and gals, the second opponent in this trifecta. And you know, how about this, guys? How did Joe Satano qualify? How did he get here? How did he move into round number one? Shame on me for forgetting for a moment. I can't forget this. Hopefully none of us can as well when Joe Satano went toe-to-toe -to -toe with quite the opponent, Michael Winslow. Freddy Krueger had some of the most iconic moments, but what made him special was the fact that he hit certain points, morality, 
horror, and humor. Put them in cheese. You get to put butter on them if they're large enough. And then you have ones that are little small ones. You can have them in a tiny bag. He had a certain way of emphasizing words. Welcome to primetime ballet. With that, he was able to make a blaze of trails for other comedians who. Joe Rosatano's guy went on New Year's Eve. Remember, we had a qualifying round on New Year's Eve. Joe Rosatano went toe to toe with Michael Winslow. Of course, he's now here in round number one. Here he is. And guys and gals, the second opponent in this trifecta is a man that is absolutely relentless. He understands psychology, fear, strategy, and the human game of chess. He brings it all to the table strength, wisdom, brain power, and desire. Before it's all said and done, even the human torch might not be able to compete with his fire. Riddle me this. Riddle me that. Shut up, Riddler. This ain't no comic book. Y'all getting the message regarding this competitor? Or are you aching to have a look? Welcome to this exclusive field. Kick that door down. No need to knock. Let's give it up for a talent and force. Last name Richards. First name Rock. Rock Richards. Welcome to the celebrity. Random Bobby Klein. Klein, thank you for having me, brother. It's Saturday night, so you know what that means. It's time for the great debate. I, I'm 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 excited. I'm ready to go. I mean, I, I can't wait to see what uh old Joe Resitano brings to the table. And on top of it all, we're talking about a mystery competitor. I mean that that alone that alone just adds that that extra like that that dynamic. The how do you how do you plan for for a mystery oh, yeah. opponent? You can't plan for them, guys. You can't plan. Remember with the rules, there will be three topics: the two individuals, and I'm about to bring the mystery competitor right now. The two individuals who have the most amount of points slash votes after three topics, those two will advance to round number two, guys and gals. You saw the list of great competitors in round number two already. There's more to come, of course. More Hall of Famers. We got 10 Hall of Famers here. Oscar winners, award winners, all trying to compete for the pride and the prize. Not just $13,000. No. Not just a trip for two degrees. No. Not just the right to call themselves Mr. Mrs. or Miss TKN. No. Also, they want to win this thing because it's about the pride. They're all winners, guys and gals. A lot of people in this tournament, we've seen them again. Everyone from... Oh, gosh, Stephen Tobolowski to Jeremy London. So many people in this tournament right now in round number two. Some of the best of the best. So with that, the wait is over. Rock's opponent and Joe's opponent. The second opponent in this trifecta is a man, guys and gals, as I brought up, is quite relentless, and his name is Rock Richards, which is why, as you could see, Rock, I want to give you a chance to speak to the viewers momentarily for about 30 seconds. What does this mean to you? Of course, the 13 grand, of course, the trip, for, but it's about the pride as well. Am I right? Well, absolutely. I mean, I mean, yeah, of course, you know, money, trips, those are all alluring. But, you know, you, you hear often like in, in wrestling that people ask you, well, who did you beat? And, brother, that exemplifies this tournament. I mean, you're talking about sports uh, Hall of Famers, uh, comedians, musicians, uh, talents of the silver screen. I mean, to if to to win this, where else? Where it's going to put can you. you it just, else? It's going to elevate you to a, a different level no matter who you are. So for someone like myself coming out of obscurity and to have a shot to to face off with with such great talents, I mean, it's a good it's a measuring stick for me. But it, it, sh it shows that uh, the, the the nature of of this whole thing. You don't you're have giving, a blemish. You're, you don't you're have a giving, blemish, Rock. You're Still giving the walk. working man a chance. Yeah. Well, guess what? I appreciate that. But, guys, you guys are incredible. Again, the home run, guys and gals, will happen after three topics. We'll find out which two competitors advanced to round number two, an exclusive and star-studded field, indeed, with some up-and-coming talent as well, a smorgasbord, if you will. Where else can you get that? Two people, two different walks of life, Hall of Famers from sports, Oscar winners, all competing for the pride of the prize, and we're doing it live. 146 straight episodes. Who else can bring you that? Nobody else does. We do, and you know the truth, guys and gals. So speaking of the truth, our third competitor right now, guys and gals, it is true. He is here with us. Our mystery competitor, who so happens to be a class act. He's humble. He's talented. That happens to be a fact. I provided hints all week. Have you figured it all out? Have you figured out all the codes? His honest and truthful body of work is impressive. Big shout out to Sherry Rhodes. Some of you are still confused as to who this competitor might be, but are you dazed? Television, film, or the stage, his work deserves to always be praised. A fellow writer, this is a true renaissance man that can truly do it all. Will his arguments tonight convince the masses like a Bob Odenkirk speech in Better Call Saul? He's here to stand victorious. When it's all said and done, he will settle for nothing less than a win. Put your hands together for a kind, humble, talented man. Last name London, first name Jason. Jason London, welcome to the Celebrity <laughs> Grand Debate Tournament. <laughs> hey, guys, how's it going, man? How are you doing, hey. Jason? 
I'm doing good. I'm doing good, man. Hanging out here, trying to not boil alive here in Florida. You were talking to me actually the other day. We spoke a few times, of course. You told me as well, you concur, it's not just about 13 grand or the trip. It's about the pride of winning the whole tournament. Am I right? Oh, man, it's just, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun regardless. Uh, you know, it's just fun to be a part of it. Absolutely. Now, what what is it about playing against or debating against the very best that you know we saw, of course, in round number two? There's a lot of competitors from all walks of life. Knowing that you're measuring yourself up as a debater against the very best, the competition is what we thrive for. Am I right, Jason? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I you know, all I can do is uh, kind of come from where uh, you know, sort of my own point of view about uh, opinions about things, and and you know, some things. Uh, the word debate is uh, you know a little. Strange because it's all uh, about opinion. I, I, I rec uh, you know, I reckon, but I, uh, I think it's a, it's a fun thing to get a chance to do. Guys and gals, Jason London and I, of course. Uh, you know, why not do it right now, Jason? Guys and gals, we're gonna do this after the match, but we're gonna do it right now. Hey, sixty plus shows. Why not sixty one? Jason London has officially joined the new network, guys and gals. We will have more news on our show. Yes, that's right. He's sticking around, guys. That means we have Jeremy London, Jason London, of course, more Hall of Famers, more great talents. Uh, this is going to be a show that covers everything you can imagine. We're going to have a lot of fun as well. We'll announce the title of the show and the artwork at a future date. But Jason London, welcome officially to the new network. Hey, glad to be here, man. This is all new to me, so I'm excited. Absolutely, guys and gals. And I'm excited as well. A quick rundown of the rules really quickly, even though we, of course, described them to our viewers. Let's run it down again. Guys, there will be three topics. You will be voting after all three competitors finish debating each singular topic. We have two wild card voters in the fans right now, the fans, guys and gals who are watching. We have two individuals who are voting whose points are worth three. Karen Price and Chad T. Can, Superfan. The judges' points are worth three. They're in the back as well. Remember, at any point, and this will help the debaters, at any point, if someone is making a point, the other competitors can simply raise their index finger and rebut them. Once they raise their index finger, I'll pop up on screen, make it official. You could rebut the person speaking. Again, after three rounds, we will total up all the points. We'll keep tallying them in the back as well. The top two vote getters move on to round number two, this exclusive field. We're again, 13,000 on the line, trip for two degrees, as you guys know, and so much more. So with that, let's start unveiling the topics and let you know who goes first. In topic number one, round number one, Joe will go first. Rock will go second. Jason will go third. Here is topic number one. It is the most influential horror film of all time. And there's a certain magic when it comes to horror. <laughs> Part of us wants to close our eyes, while the other half definitely needs to keep peeking at the horrors on screen. The horror genre was one of the very first ones to debut in cinemas. Seeing as how it was able to keep the audiences fascinated, and also their imaginations running wild, I'm not surprised. From monsters to the paranormal, there's a lot to see when it comes to horror. One reason we consume horror, perhaps, is to experience stimulation. Exposure to terrifying acts or even the anticipation of those acts can stimulate us both mentally and physically in opposing ways. Negatively, in the form of fear and anxiety. Positively, in the form of excitement or joy. For instance, watching a horror video simultaneously activates both types of stimulation with the most pleasure experienced at the most fearful moment. Many horror films have influenced filmmakers, authors, storytellers, but only a select few spoke to a great majority. So, Joe Rosatano will make a case for the original Psycho as the most influential horror film of all time. When he's finished, Rock will make a case for the original Halloween, John Carpenter's Halloween, as the most influential horror film of all time. And when Rock is finished, Jason London will make a case for The Shining, the original, as the most influential horror film of all time. Guys and gals, uh, we're going to start things off with Joe. And remember, vote fairly, guys. Even if you like the film... You shouldn't be voting because you like said film. Who made the better argument? That's how we're voting. Uh, you guys, of course, know the deal. You're the engine that makes this thing go. So many comments. We broke records last week. Let's keep breaking those records. Uh, Joe Rosatano, Rock Richards, Mr. London, are you guys ready? I'm ready. Let's go. I'm ready. Ready. Let's do this. Guys and gals, Joe will go uninterrupted unless someone rebuts him, of course. Uh, everyone will be looking on screen. Joe, the floor is yours in a three, in a two, in a U. Well, starting out, we have... 1960s Psycho, which was directed by Alfred Hitchcock. And for those who don't know, and for those who do know, let's recap, because the story goes with Marion Crane, who's a secretary in Phoenix, Arizona, and she is on the lam currently because she stole $40,000 from her boss just so she could run away with her boyfriend, who's named Sam Loomis. At that point, through exhaustion of just, just running away and tired, she starts to go on the back roads where at that point she finds a rickety ramshackle place called the Bates Motel 
where she meets a young and very upstanding gentleman named Norman Bates. From there, Norman introduces himself and he establishes that he's into taxidermy and he's a very likable, though kind of shy individual. But well, one thing you notice off the bat after he leaves from visiting with Marion is that he has a difficult relationship with his mother. After they have an argument, which Marion overhears, they have dinner together and they discuss his position and where she's going to go and why she's on the run all this time. And through talking with him, she realizes that what she's doing at this point, she, she doesn't want to take this money, this money. She doesn't want to keep it and still have it and this weight and guilt she has. So she finishes her conversation with Norman and that's when she goes to take a shower, which in this case, she feels kind of like it symbolizes like she's cleaning herself up from the guilt that she has. And in the middle of her shower, Mrs. Bates, Norman's mother, interrupts her and immediately stabs her several times. And it's, it's terrifying. It's a terrifying moment. And that immediately cements the rest of the story is this main character that is our character in the story is taken out of the picture in the ha first half of the movie. And then after that, it proceeds into a mystery where people are trying to find out who this is. Her sister comes after to look for her, her boyfriend, Sam Loomis, and then a investigator goes to find her, which in trying to find her, the investigator also gets killed and stabbed. He's on a stairway looking for her in the same house and he gets stabbed to death as well, which then through trickle down of finding out all this and making their way into the mystery, that's where her sister finds out that not only is Mrs. Bates, this person that is Norman's mother, not alive, she has been dead for several years and in going to find out where her sister is and even the investigator, she finds a dead body that is Norman's mother that has just been hanging there. And Norman comes in as his mom and is about to kill her. And this is when Everett, the police arrive, prevent it. And then from that moment, Norman is just declared mad and you think it's all fine until that ending where Norman has an inner monologue as his mother. And that's when you see he was crazy, but he's let go. That's basically the ending is he's let's go. It's done. How does that influence other movies though? How is this influential? That's where we get into this portion where Norman is a normal guy. He's not someone that immediately starts off with a mask or was a serial killer. He's a normal individual. This was established later in movies like Peeping Tom, which technically was made before that, but it didn't come out till later because of horrible laws with the Hayes office and propriety. But they did that same thing into films like, for instance, Halloween for you, Mr. Richards. Halloween established Michael as a normal kid, sort of, in that way, as well as you have Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs. You have Mrs. Pamela Voorhees from Friday the 13th, just a normal grieving mother. And then you have people like Billy Loomis and Stu Mocker from Scream. These are just normal guys. They're not intentional in trying to kill people beforehand. They're just normal people committing these acts of murder secondary we have the killer is let go and that's it they're unpunished they establish that later in films like black christmas and the texas chainsaw massacre both coming out in 1974 where at this point not only establishing that a killer can go unpunished which was indecent four years later Halloween did the same thing in its story where the killer disappears right at the end and also goes unpunished. 
And to top it all off, the music for this movie was incredible, especially with the shower sequence, because in a scientific article done by Fox News with James Miller, PhD, it was established that music, if it has a higher level of instruments, if they're a lot broader, can make it so that you feel a lot more stressed out. If, on the other hand, it goes above 80 beats per minute, which at the lowest level... Five minutes, five minutes. Okay. At the lowest level establishing, you have at 124 beats per minute, the Jaws theme, which was influenced by this. You have the Halloween theme, which was 136 beats per minute. And then you have the actual Psycho theme, which was 140 beats per minute, including Reanimator, which uses 146 beats per minute and is just the Psycho theme turned on its head and made larger. This film has so many connections, even including with Halloween, where Dr. Sam Loomis is the name of her boyfriend in Psycho, Sam Loomis, who's played by Donald Pleasance, and then Jamie Lee Curtis, who's the daughter of Janet Leigh, who played in Psycho, is the main actress in Halloween. It's like the connections are riddled everywhere in several different horror movies. So for me, that is why Psycho is continually an influence to horror. Every time you see something in one other movie, it keeps going, whether or not you know that. And that is my point for Psycho being the most influential horror movie of all time. Yes, guys, if you finish before the 10 minute has expired, you can simply let me know that you're done. I will come up on screen. Guys, Rock Richards is next. Remember, you guys can rebut Rock Richards or Jason when he's going up next simply by lifting your index finger up. And you could rebut them, ask them any question, put them on the spot, do whatever you want. That is for every competitor on screen. Rock Richards. You'll make a case for why the original Halloween from 1978, John Carpenter's Halloween, is the most influential horror film of all time. Are you ready? In a three, in a two, in a U. All right, Mr. Klein. Well, as you stated, the year was 1978, and there was an indie film distributor, and I want to get his name correct, Erwin Yablons. He decided that he wanted to make a horror film with a meager budget of $300,000. So he turns to a director who actually had some uh, success with a film called Assault on Precinct 13, Mr. John Carpenter. He approaches Carpenter with the movie. Carpenter has a few demands. Uh, one is he wants full creative control. He wants to produce the music and he wants his name above the title. And your blinds tells him, hey, look, if you can make this movie for $300,000, you can have whatever you want. So Carpenter agrees. Well, now they have to get the $300,000. So they go and see a producer by the name of Mustafa Akkad. And at first, Mr. Akkad is not really keen on the movie. He has a thought process. Well, if the movie's too expensive, it might not be worth it. But also if the movie is too cheap, it also might not be worth it. So Yablons kind of plays uh, Akkad's pride against him and tells, well, you know what, John, maybe maybe the $300,000 is a bit too much for Mr. Akkad. And of course, he's like, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. So they get the money, $300,000, and John Carpenter is supposed to make this movie in about four weeks. So you have a bunch of young, upstart actors and actresses. Of course, as Mr. Rustano mentioned, they hired Jamie Lee Curtis, whose mother was a star of Psycho. Uh, father, I believe, was Tony Curtis, very famous actor. Anyway, so you got people's moms, dads, brothers, sisters, uncles, all getting their hands dirty and producing this movie. But what they don't have initially is they don't have a name. They don't have someone that really brings that star power to the table. So after a few other choices, turns Carpenter down, he turns to Donald Pleasance. Well, he offers him 20 grand, but that isn't really enough to get Pleasance to join the film. What it takes actually is the rec uh, recommendation from uh, Pleasance's own daughter that he do the film. And the reason being is because she was a musician and she loved the music from Assault on Precinct, 
um, sorry, precinct 13. So he agrees to do the film. He's on set, man. Everyone's terrified of him. He, he, you know, he's a, he's a real presence, but what they don't know is he's really forcing the best out of them. Well, the next thing they need to do is they need a character and they decide to go. They want a, a masked maniac. Well, they don't have a lot of money. The options are limited. They go out, they get two masks. One is a clown mask. And one, as we all know, is the infamous William Shatner mask, where they got to pull the eyebrows off and take the sideburns off and cut the old eye holes out a little bigger and they paint it white. And then finally, now they have their character. But let's talk about what this film does. First of all, it's a we have some pioneering new film techniques, a special type of camera, of course, that used in the introduction of the movie where they show Michael Myers as a young boy who eventually goes through the house, puts on his mask, stabs his sister. That was innovative in itself. But what Carpenter really did was Carpenter really had a flair for using the negative space. He'd pan out with these wide shots and have, say, the main character off to the side and really just shock and amaze and all people with what they called then was the shape. And so what Carpenter also was very good at was building suspense. He doesn't give you the character right away. You don't see Michael Myers. You don't understand fully what he is building up the suspense, building up the drama. He left so much unexplained that as a fan, it draws you in. Now, with a budget so five low, minutes, five minutes. they have really not a lot of money for the special effects. So guess what? There's no little to no blood. The gore is very limited. But yet, every scene is so impactful without it. Now, they shopping the, the video around, I'm sorry, the film around, they can't get people to bite on it. Producers are looking at the film, this is not scary. It was only until after Carpenter added the music that it really got the attention that it deserved and people really wanted a piece of the movie. But what it also did, Avi, it established the main character, which you would call the final girl, the virginal free of sin character that's always left at the end of the movie to fight off the evil demon which you see for decades upon decades later. This film was the type of film that left you scared to death when you walked home from the movie theater because this character, devoid of any form, they drew inspiration from the movie Eyes Without a Face, the character that you don't see. And what that does is it almost creates this anonymity. When you see this character, you almost get afraid. You know who might be under that mask? It might be me. Because you're talking about a character who was just evil from the beginning. And this film, with its meager budget, they added 20000 extra dollars, so $320,000, ends up becoming the most profitable film, independent film, of all time and would remain that way until I believe 1999 when the Blair Witch Project came out. This movie, when, when they came up with the title, they went with Halloween. The Blondes wanted something that had to do with Halloween and it built so much strength in this title that later on movies like Friday the 13th would get produced off of just the title alone. Two minutes, two minutes. So this film, it is like the grandfather of all the slasher films. Psycho, perhaps, considered one of the first ever slasher films. But with these type of characters, you have Norman Bates. You can understand why Norman Bates went crazy. Look at what his mom did to him. Look at the way he was treated. There is no explanation for why Michael Myers is such a psycho. 
he's he he's unexplainable, which again leads to that um for the creative process in your own mind to understand this character. And the it's basically laid out the blueprint for the next 50 years of what a slasher film is. If you don't have Halloween, you don't have Friday the 13th, you don't have Nightmare on Elm Street, you don't have any of the any of the film that films and horror that we see today. And I, that's I'm good. Very good, guys and gals. Joe Satano and Rock Richards made their argument. Remember, so much on the line. You guys and gals can start voting when Jason London is finished making his point. Again, Joe Rosatano, Rock, Jason London, uh, two two individuals here who have been here for a while. Jason London announced earlier with myself, of course, part of an amazing roster that makes up the new network. Jason will be making a point, guys and gals, for The Shining as the most influential horror film of all time. Jason, are you ready to go? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm as ready as I can be, I guess. In, in a three, in a two, in a you. All right. Yeah, well, you know, uh, I, I'm coming from, I guess, a different place than these guys are coming from in the sense of all I can do is really talk about the way that the that the movie The Shining affected me in comparison to the way that the other movies uh, affected me. Um, you know, I remember uh, trying to watch that Psycho when I was younger and black, back then, black and white movies were boring to me and, and it took me until I probably until well after I had even seen, you know, the shining before I even appreciated psycho, which was brilliant. Um, but, uh, for, for me personally, I think I have to go on just basically <clears throat> what it would make me feel because I, you know, creature features and hide and seek, uh, horror movies where the, you know, the, the girls running from the, the guy and trips and falls and then runs again and luckily gets like a blow in or two and then gets, beat up again and gets away and all of that which is a lot of fun and my mom's youngest sister she used to babysit us and uh, I'm probably gonna get her in trouble but uh, she used to you know she she was fairly young herself and she used to love to play these movies for us so um, you know whenever she would rent them and uh, and uh, and so we got to watch a lot of them and and we got to where we really enjoyed I really enjoyed the you know the Friday the 13th and the things like that but, uh, especially I loved, loved, um, you know, you, you know, all of the slasher movies and all that. But then, whenever I w watched um, The Shining, it, it it hit me in a, a way that was different uh, than the other movies because it's a constant question uh, of what's going on. I mean, you sort of get the feeling of how eerie the the hotel is as soon as they uh, pull up and get in there, and it's freezing cold. It's it's a morgue already, basically outside, and. Um, you know, you sort of get that. It's a gigantic space, but incredibly claustrophobic feel. And uh, like I said, maybe just being a filmmaker or whatever, I got kind of go off of how, how did it make me feel and what did I feel about it? And there's there's a difference in, you know, in, in sort of like the Freddy movies or whatever, like going for the bad guy. You're like, yeah, yeah, go Freddy, get him. And then where it's like, holy shit, like get away from this guy because he's nuts. And there's so many different levels to the onion of The Shining of of what's going on is it is the entire place haunted is it this thing that's going to happen to literally anybody that that takes care of the place over the winter uh, you know where what are his ghosts you know i think it's sort of you know talks about it and you you see he's uh, fighting uh, alcoholism and he's sort of like you know he's not only there with real demons but he's fighting his own demons and um you know i think that the number one star uh, of it is is Stanley Kubrick. I mean, uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I would watch anything that the, that the man directed, and I think I pretty much have. And he's, you know, he's brilliant. Um, and you know, it was, uh, you know, as soon as you know, I'm I'm you know, go to Blockbuster and uh, you know, rent the movies with your aunt and get, not tell your mom uh, years old. And so, you know, as soon as the Shining and and uh, came out on on v, uh, VHS and my aunt showed that to us. That scared me more than any of the other um, sort of slasher camp, you know, hide and seek movies. Um, so I think it's more for me. I appreciate the the psychological aspect of horror uh, more than gore and more than vampires and more than 
zombies and things like that. I, it's the the true underlying thing of like, could that really happen to me in real life? As opposed to some of the other things, which is like, a, clearly, like, it's not going to happen. We can have a lot of fun with this. But so, you know, you 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 wonder, I, I wonder myself if I had to spend an entire winter in that big, creepy uh, hotel, would I perhaps lose my marbles a little bit as well? So it's like the aspect of like, is there some sort of supernatural haunting to it? What's the whole situation with the sun and why is he, you know, able to see things that other people can't see? And um, it just has more and more layers of it, and, uh, you know, and then once you start sort of slowly figuring out uh, what the truth is about everything, with Scatman Crothers, wonderful character, and um, about the fact that it's all, he's just sort of uh, in this hall of ghosts. Uh, are, are they real? Were they real at one point? You know, what's his relationship with them? They, you know, he says something along the lines of how he's kind of always been there. And you don't really figure that out. And, you know, it takes like a, it's a head scratcher because <clears throat> my best conclusion to it was that it, it basically shows at the end of the, very, of the movie, you know, there's that photograph of, of him back in like 1929 um, in the crowd in the in the same hotel. So is it the same? Is it a reincarnation of the same soul over and over and over experiencing the same thing, but just in a different time period or is he a ghost himself but if he is how do you explain the you know him having the wife and the kid and you know what the hell's going on with the kid in the first place and the you know things like the red rum thing the blood in the hall the twins all of that those are the and being a twin <laughs> you know cheating a little bit there with that one but it creeped me the hell out and so that's really about all i have to say it's just kubrick all the way really with it and jack nicholson was of course jack nicholson so i have to say I'm, I'm something done. Okay, hold one second, Joe. Uh, Bill Paxton, who I used to write for, the late Bill Paxton, I would always ask a relative of his, either a cousin or an uncle, what are your three favorite horror films? And his uncle would say The Shining, Halloween, and of course, Psycho. Joe. Yeah. And and he asked him, he, what did you like about those films? He goes, I don't know. I never watched them. That's why they're my favorites. They're, that, they're already <laughs> scary. They're already, already mind-blowing to me. So, And that's Bill Paxton, who, again, God rest his soul, Yes, also, God, uh, he's a wonderful, incredible human being. Without question. And I thought yeah. one of the most underrated horrors is a film he directed called Frailty. Maybe one day we'll talk about Frailty, which is a oh, classic yeah. as well. Yeah. Guys and gals, incredible because Jason London, of course, most influential film influenced him. Joe Rosatano, Rock Richards, a film, films that influenced, of course, the masses as well. Different perspective, different takes. Who spoke to you the most and why? Determine via your votes as to who you think won this round. We have two more to go no matter what. Remember, it's a collective thing. It's not an individual thing. After three topics have been debated and discussed, the top two vote-getters will advance to round number two. Let's bring in the judges right now because they have a say. Howard Collado, who gets your vote and why? My vote is going to go to Rock Richards. Um, he really talked about the technical uh, innovation that Halloween brought to the table. He talked about the use of negative space, how you're not given too much also about the character as well, and how there was a neutrality to the uh, mask that kind of elicited from the viewer uh, this thing of being able to project anything <coughs> that you want onto the mask as well. So my vote's going to go with Rock. Eric, please tally those in the back, my friend. I'll pull you up last to vote. So right now we are at the judges' points and votes are worth three. Rock has three points very early on in topic number one. Let's bring in Megan. Who do you vote for and why? Well, I really enjoyed all of the debates. Uh, I did notice that I feel like both Joe and Rock really brought in how things connected to other things, whereas Jason talked more about how it affected him personally, which I enjoyed. But I think that because of that, uh, for this one in particular, because Joe also brought up Halloween as being one of the things that was influenced by Psycho. Uh, I'm going to go with Joe for this one. Joe Rosatano gets three points, guys and gals, very early on of here. John, please unmute your microphone. Pete Sharpie, I'm going to bring you in to vote. Hey, everyone. Hello. Uh, give me once. Pete is having tech problems. I will put you backstage. Giselle, let us know who you vote for and why. 
You love using that name, don't you? Good yes, evening, gentlemen. Yes, Mr. London, welcome. Okay. We are very excited to have you here. Mr. Rosatano, I very much appreciated how you spoke of the various films which Psycho influenced Mr. Richards. I very much appreciated how you spoke of the techniques used and gained that other films used in the past. I have to agree with Megan on this one. I was very torn until she brought up that point and this was going to be a question I asked. Would we have had a Halloween without a Psycho? And because Joe also mentioned that Psycho influenced Halloween, my vote goes to Mr. Rizzitano. All right, so that is uh, another three points there for Mr. Rizzitano. Eric, if you can please log that in the back, I would appreciate that. Mr. Pete, are you ready to go? Ready to vote? I hope that you are. Very good. Okay, who do you vote for and why? I apologize about that. All right, so all three films, you got Psycho, Halloween, The Shining. As a kid, The Shining hit differently, and I agree with Jason, personal experience, everything on that, how it influenced them. A, a, a lot of things personally and watching horror films, but Joe actually hit the connections between films and how each film influenced another. And I, I believe that's what the topic was all about. So my vote goes for Joe. Joe Rosatano gets another vote, guys. If we go to the tally right now, again, judges points and votes are worth three points each. So right now we are at nine to three, Joe in the lead. Let's bring in John Red. John, who do you vote for and why? How you guys doing? Good to see you, John. So I was back and forth between Joe and Rock. I think it comes down to Joe laid out pretty much that it was the granddaddy of them all. I, and, I, and I agree with Kate, Giselle, you don't have a Halloween without a psycho. So yeah, but I want to I want to bring this up, guys, again to all our judges and everybody watching again. Who made the better point? Who made the better argument? Not saying it's Joe, not saying it's Jason, not saying it's Rock, because guess what? My votes don't count. I am not voting. Thank God I'm a moderator. But let's remember who made the better argument. We know Psycho was the innovator. We get that. Who made the better argument? That's what we have to do here, guys, when we're voting. No bias. Joe, John, go ahead. Finish your point, please. Absolutely. Um, you had talked about uh, when you were when you were debating Joe, you had talked about the the, the scenes, the way they set the scenes up and for it be the, the very first horror film that didn't have the guy to be punished at the end. Now that That's uh, that's kind of what put it over for me. Who are you voting for? Joe Rosatano. Okay, another three points for Joe. Let's bring in Eric Heron, who will be giving us his take on who wins this particular round and why. Hey guys, welcome back to the green room. Mr. London, it's a pleasure to have you. Rock, good to see you, brother. Joe, how you doing? So let's get down to brass tacks for a minute. Joe, you had me lost there for a minute. I'm going to be honest. Running down the plot of Psycho, I was kind of wondering where you were going with it. Then you hit your notes about Norman being portrayed as normal. I don't know about that so much. But you did go where the killer went unpunished. You talked about the score. Great points to you. Moving over to Mr. Richards, who gave a, a thesis on why Halloween was much more influ influ Sorry, guys. I'm having a hard time talking much more influential than even psycho was because of the things that spawned the entire slasher genre spawned because of Halloween. Now, now we get to where we're going real, the shining, the shining being one of the most influential films of all time, not just because of the horror, not just because of the gore, because of what Mr. London spoke of the psychological aspect, the cabin fever aspect of it. This could really happen. I know if he felt the chill in his bones when he watched it, I felt the chill in my bones when I watched it. Ladies and gentlemen, Jason London, three points to him. Eric Heron votes for Jason London, guys and gals. Right now, let me give you the recap before we turn it over to our viewers. The engine that makes this entire thing go. Uh, 12 for Joe Rosatano, three for Rock Richards, and three for Jason London. Top two vote getters advance. Remember, it isn't merely one person who advances. The top two will advance to round two. Brian Last, let's tally this, votes for Rock Richards. My vote for Rock Richards all did great, but he is right on the final girl has been such an influence on modern slashers. Guys, again, where else, what other show can your votes determine the outcome of a match nowhere else but here live as well? Claire Shields votes for Joe. So one more point for Joe. Okay, got that. Christopher, this is interesting here. Okay, 
All three movies were great. Groundbreaking. My vote goes to Joe. Okay, he votes for Joe Rossitano. Got that. Chris votes for Joe. Cedric's votes for Joe Rossitano. He has my vote. Again, guys and gals, this is all live, and that's what we do here. Phil says, Rock brought out so many subtle factors. Rock gets my vote. A vote from Phil to Rock Richards. Gus Anselmo says, this is without bias. He had it in the bag. Timely and precise. Rock had great points. Detail is great, but it wasn't as concise as Joe's point. You didn't vote. Don't know who you're voting for. You're making good points there, but <laughs> you vote. Uh, Sean Stasiak, all men made great points. And I love all three flicks, but Joe had such a great layout and delivery of numerous films that all connected. Joe has my vote. You are all freaking psychos. From you, I take it as a compliment. Mr. Stasiak, thank you. Uh, Zane Beatty votes for Joe. Okay. Jaleesa Bailey votes for Rock Richards. Point goes for Rock. Uh, you like Joe's argument. That's not a vote. Thank you, Randy, though. We appreciate you. Thank Let you. us know what you're voting for. we got to make it official. Andrew Red the Fourth. Got to go with Jason. Kept it real. Start to finish. Sunshine, Vought. My vote is for Jason. Two more votes for yes. Jason London right now, guys and gals. Chad, his points are worth three. He's one of our wild card voters. All three men debated awesome. Joe just hit hardcore facts. I vote for Joe, and I have never been a psycho fan. There you go. Okay, three points go to Joe Risitano. Uh, Gus says, I voted above Avi. I will get there, my friend. I'm doing this live. Thank you very much. Mindy says, Joe nailed it. He gets my vote. Another point for Joe Ricitano. Guys, I am. I do not have. A, I don't have a tech person. It's not how it works here. Doing this in the back. So give me a moment as I scroll up live, and also give you the sweet nectar that emanates from my voice. Hopefully, Mary votes for Joe with a heart emoji as well to drive it home. Jeff Reader votes for Joe. So two more points for Joe Ricitano. No. Okay. Cheryl Riley votes for Joe as well. Julie Hall says all three had great points of view. Really close, but I'm voting for Rock Richards on this in this round. Rock gets another point. Brian says, going with Joe. His deep deep research wins it. Psycho had many layers. Okay. So Rock and Joe get another one. Dakota says, Jason has my vote. So one more point and vote goes to Jason London. Haley Huckabee votes for Jason London. Two more points for Jason London. Uh, Gus, now I got your vote. Mr. Ricitano, he hammered it straight to the point, finished in the time of the fashion, mentioning the staircase kill was a great moment, and you showed it its importance, its place overall, and its place in the moments. Very good. Gus and Salmo read everything. Got your point right now as you voted for Joe Ricitano. Stella Castellano says, Joe talked about what made it influential. Jason talked about how it made him feel, and Rock, why it was mere influential. My vote goes for Rock Richards. Rock gets a vote on this one. Mindy votes for Joe Ricitano over here, so back and forth affair. Lauren Smith says, Joe gets my vote. Okay. Andrew Red the Fourth says, Jason gets my vote. Okay. Karen Price, with her three points, votes for Joe. Mary Lloyd votes for Joe. Jester Gambit says, Joe wins. It's not a vote. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I, I am one of those guys. I am sorry. You've got to be very exact and detailed. That's who I am. Let's make sure we make our vote official, guys and gals. Beverly Presley, I got your vote here. I think you said you were – let me pull this up, who you're voting for. Let's see what we got. Karen Calabretta, I'm trying to get yours as well. Guys, we're about to debate the second topic momentarily as we count this down. Okay, I believe I am missing maybe one or two. If I am, let me know now, and I will make sure I reserve your comments over here. Trick Trixie says, I vote Jason. He said exactly what I was thinking. So Trixie Mitchelson votes for Jason London. Okay. No problem, Gus. No problem. We love you all. You're the engine that makes this thing go. We don't do this without you guys. That's true. We'd have great conversations, but we wouldn't be recording them if you weren't listening or watching. So thank you. Randy says, okay, Joe has my vote. Thank you, Randy. Appreciate you. All right. More votes. Jira Red votes for Rock Richards. Avi Klein Octopus working all day. Well, just true. 21 hours. Appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, Brian Clark says, is that, no, that's Sean Stasiak. Uh, yes. Yes, he does, people. Yes, Sean's trademark there. The yes, he does. More on that later. Uh, we have Davis Jubilee voting for Mr. London. Mr. London. Thank you again, Gus. I appreciate that. Totally not about me. It's about these amazing competitors in this field who are really giving it your all, but thank you. Uh, Jester says, I vote for Joe Ricitano. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Stasiak. I appreciate that. Uh, more and more comments coming down the pike. I concur. Great, strong arguments by all from all three men. Claire, I got your vote for Joe already, so don't worry about that. Guys, here's here's the tally. 
37, 10, 9. So Jason London is in second place with 10. Rock Richards in third place with nine. As you can see, we count all your votes. We do it live because we want to be very fair, and that is how we do it. Again, guys and gals, the Celebrity Grand Debate Tournament, I got to tell you, 18 years of screenwriting for one of the best studios in the world. I've never done anything like this. This is why I do this. It's live. It's competitive. So many different elements. Wait till you see some of the mystery competitors coming down the pike as well. More Oscar winners, Hall of Famers, but... Guess what? It's not about the title of the person. It's about the person wearing the title. Jason London, Joe Rosatano, Rock Richards, class acts, class personified. We're moving on to the second round. Kara does vote for Rock, so another vote for Rock Richards. Bob Cook says, I vote for Joe. It was about the influence, and Joe tied it together best. Okay, so two more votes, one for Rock and one for Joe. Julie says, I vote Rock Richards, so another vote for Mr. Rock Richards. Lee Thistlewait, don't know what I'm voting for, but just because I'm, I vote for Mr. London. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, guys and gals, right now we are going to begin with round number two. Again, let's tally this up. Jason London and Rock Richards are tied at 11. Why does that matter? First of all, they can make a comeback and win and get that top spot. But even if they don't get that top spot, the second person also moves on to round number two with a brand clean slate, a brand new slate in round number two. So there you go. Guys, we're going to discuss round number two right now, and let me bring up the topics. The topic is greatest heavy metal band of all time. The human brain responds to music in fascinating ways. Many people may identify music as a form of emotional expression, or even more personally, as an extension of themselves. Music can also be tied to specific moments, both good and bad. But when it comes to heavy metal, there tends to be many misconceptions. But science may point to some significant mental health benefits. Is heavy metal good for your mental health? The answer is yes. Metal is typically described as loud, energetic, sometimes with vocals that are shouted and screamed as well as sung. And if you love the way that sounds, this unique music genre can positively impact your mental health. It's typical for metal songs to pair emotional lyrics with a genre's hallmark larger-than-life sound. Listening to metal can help provide an outlet for processing intense emotions such as anger. It can also relieve stress. Uh, good for me because I'm a Knicks fan. For metal lovers... <laughs> High level of energy can help provide an emotional release, and listening to metal music can benefit both your body and mind, and may even help your immune system, according to over 5,000 different studies on the matter. So guys, in this particular round, Mr. Rock Richards will start first, Mr. Jeremy London will go second. Uh, excuse me? Jason. Jason. Yeah. Jason. <laughs> yes, just Mr. London. I'm Jason. Jason. Did I say, did I say, um, I am so sorry. <laughs> and you know, and I pride myself on never doing that ever, but I just it's did. Not the, so. It's not the first time. Though. Don't worry it about is, it. It's not the first. Okay. My fault. <laughs> Guys and gals, guess what? When Jason London and I start our new show, there'll be 10 <laughs> minutes at least where I allow Jason while I'm muted to insult the ever living hell out of me and Mr. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally okay. I promise you. I promise uh, you. And the first off, you know, you can confuse me for my brother. It's not an insult. So. No I appreciate that. And Jeremy's a dear friend, and I love him, and he's part of this network. And guys and gals, again, just to let you know, Jason London, again, part of this new network, uh, two totally different people, two totally different individuals who have amazing mm. careers. I do not ever, ever link two people together. Jason is a man of his own. And again, mm. Freudian slip, we're here live. That's what happens sometimes. <laughs> no, it's all good, man. Guys and gals, Rock Richards will make a case for Metallica as the greatest heavy metal band of all time. Jason London will make a case for Black Sabbath. Excuse me, will make a case for Led Zeppelin as the greatest heavy metal band of all time. And Joe Rosatano will make a case, guys and gals, for Black Sabbath as the greatest heavy metal band of all time. So with that, guys and gals, uh, let's continue on over here. Let's make sure there's no other votes for the last round. No, I think we got everybody. So, Mr. Richards, if you're ready, take it away in a three, in a two, in a U. All right, guys. Metallica. It's a band formed in 1981, uh, originally founded by two members, uh, Lars Ulrich and James Hetfield. James's family was uh, practiced something, I believe it was called Christian science. This means that they don't believe in going to the doctors. They don't let their kids go to health class. But one thing that did happen was uh, Hetfield actually went and took piano lessons, which he loathed, except for the fact that it, it, it gave him a little bit of a knowledge in music. Um, Lars Ulrich, his father, was a pro tennis player, along with his grandfather. So he was actually, I believe, in Denmark and had a promising uh, future in tennis. 
But he also had a love for rock and roll music, which eventually won out. Um, so Hetfield started a couple bands, didn't really go anywhere. Lars Ulrich actually tries out for the band, and they're not really that impressed with his music, so they don't let him join. However, in the future, somehow, miraculously, without even having a song, Lars Ulrich gets a song on a compilation album, which he uses as this huge lore to get Hetfield and the rest of the guys to form a band with him, which they do. They eventually... Uh, and he reluctantly listens to the demo, but a gentleman by the name of John Zazula. Here's the demo. Of course, this guy, he loves it. He thinks this is the future of music. So he actually goes out and starts his own record label just to produce these guys' music. So he gives them 30 grand and he sends them to New York and they record their first album. Well, initially, they pitched the album. They can't get anyone to bite. No one wants to put this album in stores. And it is because the original artwork is a hand with a dagger coming up out of a toilet. And they were originally going to call the album Metal Up Your Ass. <laughs> well, I believe it was Cliff Burton who uh, made a few off comments and then said about this producers, kill them all. And he always carried this hammer around everywhere that he went. And he would re renown for just tearing stuff up with it. So the original album cover is a hand holding a red hammer with blood all over it. And they renamed the album Kill Them All. So it gets put out. Sells about 60,000 copies. We're not talking about any type of commercial success here. But establishes that these guys can actually make pretty good music. It wasn't until the third album, Master of Puppets, when these guys actually start seeing some commercial success. But where the band becomes big, where they really make their name is with the album and Justice for All. Now, they get their first nomination. Best, uh, what is it? Best hard rock metal performance. They think they got it in the bag. Who else can beat these guys? I mean, they're the first. They, they perform at the Grammys. They're on the side of the stage. And guess who wins the, the award? Jethro Tull. <laughs> Hard to explain, but there it is. But that was okay. Because in the, later on in the future, you're talking about a band that won nine Grammys from 23 <laughs> nominations. They had six consecutive number one albums debut on the Billboard 200. Okay. They sold over 125 million albums worldwide. In 2019, there was a study that said they sold 22.1 million tickets. They've performed in 48 countries. They performed on seven continents. They sold like over $125 million in merch. And they are the top selling metal band for the last 40 years. And if that doesn't sell you, I don't know what. <laughs> Rock Richards, guys, making a case for Metallica. Guys, again, I just want to remind you in case you're missing or you haven't tuned in uh, up until this very moment earlier, Jason London and myself announced our brand new show. We'll be talking about a lot of things. I, I can't wait to ask Jason what it was like his first day on a movie set as they started unloading. All the lights, the equipment, it became terrifying. so real. <laughs> so terrifying. But you got to admit, though, there's something cool about you working with old cameras, uh, 35 millimeter, man. I, 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 I can't believe I got so lucky to be able to experience that with the old fashioned everything. And uh, it's really cool to have gotten to be a part of that. We're going to talk about that experience, of course, because again, guys, Jeremy London walked in wanting to, to do the acting thing. Jason London, of course. Uh, perhaps a little bit something else. We'll tease you. We'll let you know what that aspiration was at the time. But man, oh man, two incredible careers, two incredible gentlemen. Uh, this is going to be an amazing show with new artwork and a title coming down the pike very soon, which we'll announce right over here. Joe Rositano is chomping at the bit to rebut. So go ahead, rebut, my friend. There are two, technically three points that you could have brought up that actually would be very good to influence your argument 
One specifically is that the first album, though not officially produced onto it, Dave Mustaine of Megadeth was one of the individual guitarists. As much as he was kicked out for his drug usage, that was one of the main factors that actually pushed them and that first recording to get the recognition it got. Two, the significance of why Master of Puppets afterwards into and Justice for All was so significant was because of the fact that Cliff Burton, in their bus accident during touring, had just passed away. And that was one of the biggest parts of the band, including how it got into how Injustice for All was produced, which three, technically, despite the fact that Jason Newstead, I personally, I will say, and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to do middle figure, had uh, not the best fit and produced with them, the reason why it went down in for me was because of the fact that they had taken down the bass part because of the fact that Ten Lars could not hear. Rebuttal. 10 seconds. Rock, do you that's want to it. respond to that? Well, yeah, that's true. I mean, Dave and Stane did went off to, um, to form Megadeth. Uh, you're talking about Metallic with one of the big four, which was uh, Slayer, Megadeth, uh, Metallica, and uh, Anthrax. And they really created this genre of what they termed thrash metal. Okay, guys, but Rock Richards, true. Rock Richards, and Joe Rosatana going at it right now. Guys, again, right now we're going to kick it over to Mr. Jason London, uh, who will make a case as well. But before we do so, I just want to let you know again, a great show coming down the pike. We will mention the title. We might even talk about the people of Bulgaria. You fell in love with them, didn't you? I did. I did. Can't wait to talk about that, guys and gals. But right yeah. now, we're talking about the Grand Debate Tournament, and we are talking about Jason London making a case for Led Zeppelin as the greatest heavy metal band of all time. Are you ready, sir? All right. Well, I, I, like I said, I, I'm, I'm not an encyclopedia like these guys, uh, so I don't come in locked and loaded with tons of like stats and, to, and uh, facts and all that. All I can do is uh, once again kind of go off of what's the how did it make me feel and and those kind of things and uh you know i started playing guitar whenever i was about uh I don't know, 11 12 years old but it was back you know in oklahoma and you played like the same three country chords that kind of thing and then as soon as i started <laughs> getting to listen to a little more uh, uh rock and roll and things like that you know uh, getting to hear zeppelin for the first time um you know and my mom was all about it and so was my dad you know they were like you know you gotta you know, listen to these guys, fantastic. And I immediately went to the guitar store and got all of the all of the books on how to play certain things. Of course, when you're first starting, that is not really the greatest uh, starter's book to do. To do. <laughs> but I learned how to play quite a few of their songs uh, fairly early on, and 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 just that's what they've been such a great influence on me. And and I like the other bands that you guys are talking about. It's just you, I'm kind of going on, especially when it comes to rock and roll. I kind of go on. What, what's your style and, and th sort of thrash metal has always given me an incredible amount of anxiety <laughs> i'm way more of the soundtrack <laughs> being confused, you know and that's another one too this is kind of a layup for me anyways because of the, you know if, if you just you know the movie days and confused thank you everybody um it was great but it was the soundtrack that was great but the song Dazed and Confused, if you if you just close your eyes and when that kicks in you know exactly the song that it is and you know you know what's coming and it was to to me is the greatest lead in for the, uh, incredible like dramatic leads you know along with the uh, pink floyd and a few other bands that just had you know you had jimmy on the guitar just creating magic and then and and in my opinion you know the greatest rock and roll uh, perfect rock and roll voice uh, was, was you know was robert and i just i think that you know, and his voice is great now. The stuff that he's doing now is getting older is really cool. But when he had that sort of high pitch, um, that that thing that he had, that sort of beautiful whine that he had to his voice, and uh, and those guys, and I and I love all the all the footage from back in the day when you could tell those guys were toasted. You know, it's so really <laughs> great. And that's what I love about you know him Woodstock or whatever is watching watching them. You know. <laughs> those guys, those guys, who knows how much acid those guys were on all of there, but um, you know, and so uh, yeah, the, you know, Joe Cocker's performance changed me and everything. But um, you know, getting back to Led Zeppelin, it, it, you know, the, the, they are the influence for all the other bands that most people talk about, and 
and um, you know the the movie the, the the influence that they've had on on so many people, and you know um, in a way to sort of get, get nostalgic. It was like it, it for me. It reminds me of when I first uh, moved to Los Angeles, and it was sort of the soundtrack to me driving. I'm a country kid. And I, yeah, I moved to Los Angeles, and this was before GPS. We, we had a thing called the Thomas Guide back then, and you had to find your way around. And it was pretty scary of being a country bumpkin in a city like that. So that was sort of my soundtrack in my in my car when I was going from place to place, and it got me there. So as far as influential goes, you know, for me, that is by far the most influential. You know, I always say that it's like if it's a, one of the bands that you're sick of hearing, that means it's because they're that great. And so it's like whenever they're on, I don't flip the radio off of the channel because I don't like them anymore. It's because I want to keep loving them, <laughs> you know, because it can be it's real saturation sometimes. So, hey, that's me. Uh, these guys are amazing. Oh, we have a <laughs> guys and gals. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, I have, we, we, hold on here. I've got a, an alarm on the phone here. OK, there we go. All right. There we go. Can you hear us, Jason? Yeah. And, that, and the, you know, and then I think Zeppelin had uh, an influence on everything across the board, even hip hop, everything else. So. That's you know, I want to bring this up. I want to bring this up as well, guys. Before we continue, Jason, can you hear me? I can. You know, a lot of people get lost when they think about the meaning of what Dazed and Confused was. It, it wasn't supposed to be about drugs. It's about Correct. growing up. And there must have been yep. something happening right after that film because every script you get sent a couple of months would have even sometimes marijuana included. They thought you were Randall. And I guess your agent had his hands full for a while disposing of a lot of weed, so to speak. Yeah, they, yeah, he he told me that because this was yeah. uh, William Morris, and he said that um, you know there was a certain period of time and the, you know, people would just uh, send it in the mail. You know, he would have to go like through the mail, of course. And so there were a lot of the guys that worked in the mail room that were very, very happy. So I guess I definitely didn't take it. I was like, I'm not going to take somebody something somebody sent me in the mail. But, Absolutely, um, guys and gals. Yeah. Those, you know, those dudes didn't give a crap. No. They were like, yeah, we got Jason London tweet. Right, right. And, you know, again, that's one of the uh, one of the jobs that the agents have to do. Uh, I got sent a, a work from my literary agent that I looked at. Within two pages, I said no. Within two minutes, I called him and my agent said yes. I said no. He won and I said yes. <laughs> that's it. Sometimes, guys, you got to pay the bills no matter what. But you got to make the best out of each experience. You've worked with some of the greats. Robert England, of course, who's become a good friend of yours, uh, working yes. with him. You also worked yes. with Robert Carradine. Did you, did you ever get tempted to ask him to do the Lewis laugh? The, you know, the... No, I, you know, I, yeah, I didn't. It was interesting. We were in the same, we were in the same uh, movie. I believe it was a sci-fi movie. Yeah. Um, and But we didn't really have any scenes together. So I, I got to um, have a, a group of us had dinner a couple of times, and I got to hang out with them then. So, yeah, it wasn't really the appropriate time to, to but do But there was that. a curiosity. But I do remember that lab. It was genius. Yeah, there was it's a, I've worked, gotten to work with a lot of people, and it's that, that it's really hard to not ask them to do a certain something from their film or whatever. I, uh, I get uh, it. Ab absolutely, absolutely. But again, guys, uh, what we're trying to do here again is remind you guys that you're the engine. You guys vote. There's a snippet here as you're catching between each segment of Jason and I talking about our upcoming show. We'll announce it later at a date live here on the Green Room, and more on that later, guys and gals. Once again, the Grand Debate Tournament continues right off the bat. Uh, Jason London. Joe Rosatano and Rock Richards. Joe will make a case for why he thinks Black Sabbath is, of course, right now, the, and forevermore, most and greatest heavy metal band of all time. Joe, are you ready to go? I am ready to go. In a three, in a two, in a you. <laughs> so Tony Iommi, the guitarist for Black Sabbath, before he had auditioned and created Black Sabbath, was working in a sheet metal factory and having had this moment where he was about to join a band, he thought, you know what? I'm going to get success. I'm going to be the guy that makes this thing work. And so he puts in his two weeks without any context of how good this band's going to be. And he goes to back to his home for lunch and he's just enjoying his time. And his mom looks at him and says, why are you here right now? Like, what's the deal with you? And Tony says, well, I put in my two weeks, you know, I'm fine. And she says, you get back to that factory and you finish your shift. So he goes in 
And as soon as he gets in, the guy who's there that's supposed to run this large sheet metal machine that's a press hadn't arrived when was a complete no-show. So they told Tony, hey, you got to be the one that's going to run that machine. And so as soon as he goes to run it, as he's putting his, oh, okay, as he puts his hands into the machine, the press comes down on his two fingers, his middle and ring finger. And in that moment, as he pulls back, he pulls the ends of his fingers off. Told by the doctors after that, that he would not be able to play music again, ever. You, sh you shouldn't even look into it. And at that moment, he fashions himself some pieces of soap and some leather, and he makes little finger caps for himself so he can continue to play those chords anyway. And that is where the start of this comes from, of how someone in the worst of situations makes it into something better. And that is what you can see from all of Black Sabbath's career in general as a heavy metal band. Starting off with the lineup, you have Ozzy Osbourne as their main singer, who instead of conventional singing had a creepy wail. And you start off with him always introducing himself with outfits similar to Led Zeppelin, where he just had an automatic presence that could glow the room. Then you have Geezer Butler, who is playing very similarly a very thumpy bass, which in the case of the Encyclopedia Britannica, with what they define as heavy metal, it's loud music, vocals that are harsh, thumping bass, and dark lyrics. And man, did they have a ton of those. But then we got Bill Ward on the drums, who for his drumming in creation, he put his drums kind of all sideways to make this trash can effect. So for their song, Children of the Grave, they immediately start off with to kind of give all of us like this very paranoid effect to their music with his start from that start there their first six albums were hit after hit after hit they tried lowering after the third second album on their third album is where they got darker because tony's fingers from that accident connecting <laughs> hurt so much so they tuned it down a half step to go even darker on volume four which is where they brought in even more dark messages snow blind say super not and at this point ozzy constantly was taking drugs and drinking to where they got to their sixth album they decided we can't have you keep doing this. And so by album eight, because of how things work and you'll see, they just let him stay there. Kind of like the ex that they just couldn't let go from that moment. So after their eighth album is finally when they sacked him and brought in from fresh off of rainbow, Ronnie James Dio and Ronnie James Dio was already well versed in such things as how to, influence and vocalize similar to Robert Plant, but at this time he was more operatic in his approach. So where Ozzy Osbourne had a creepy wail that he used to influence himself, at this point, Ronnie James Dio brought in the fantasy genre. So till that point, all they had was doom metal and sludge metal. <laughs> and Ronnie <laughs> brought in fantasy, knights, armor, the glory of battle. And then he brought in the mob rules where if you listen to fools, the mob rules, and that was the mentality that they went with. And they created the speed metal genre with the fast pace and even took from it the gallop from Iron Maiden, which you would think wouldn't work with someone that started out bluesy, but they made it work. And from the two minutes, two minutes. And from there, they had went through several singers. They went through Rudy Gillian and Glenn Hughes, both from Deep Purple, so heavy metal gods. And then finally landing on Tony Martin, who was a no-name himself, brought the band back into fame with their music. 
and created a larger scape where they became more reflective of their nature. And finally, it went right back to Ozzy. And it started where it went with doom, gloom, rain, and church bells. And established a lot of themes that went from forgiveness of fathers or the hatred of fathers to how to encounter death and the realization that nothing is ever more that simple. That's my time. Joe Rosatano, guys. So round two is officially over. We have one more round to go. Uh, Jason, I want to bring this up as well. Again, teasing some of audience members uh, for our first episode and some of the topics that we will delve deeply into. One of the things I like about you and your brother, Jeremy, both Jason and Jeremy, come from humble beginnings. Uh, you know, again, wearing Walmart rustlers instead of Wranglers. Uh, yeah, kids make fun of you for wearing pay less shoes, right? I mean, that's right. Yeah, that's right. You sure did. Yes. And that's why you Hollywood. Talk, you obviously talk to Jeremy. No, no, I didn't. I, I do my research, my friend. I do my research. Oh, right on. Yeah. You got to oh, talk to Jeremy it. about me, is what you got to do, Jason. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a, that's a yeah, very humble beginning, too. And I like that because, again, being down to earth, it's something that comes across guys and gals on screen here as we're looking at Jason London and, of course, Jeremy as well. You can tell two individuals who do this because they love it, but nothing Hollywood about them. Guys and gals, there's a lot of Hollywood going on over here because there's drama. Uh, there's anticipation. We're all waiting to see who wins this round. So let's bring in the judges as I zip my lip. Howard Collado, who do you vote for in this round and why? Oh, man, I, I love this topic. Amazing job, Bobby. You know, this spoke to me um, on many levels. But in terms of being objective, um, Rock Richards, I needed to hear uh, the fact that Metallica took uh, punk and took uh, the new wave of British heavy metal and kind of, influ and kind of merged them to make their sound. I needed to kind of hear that. Uh, Joe Versitano, I have a question for you. Do you know who uh, uh, Django Reinhardt is? Django Reinhardt, I actually do not, but I keep hearing him brought up with Black Sabbath. Okay, because you did hit the gel, uh, the, the fingertip story, which is awesome, but what also influenced Tony was Django Reinhardt, who is a jazz musician who also uh, had, I think he was also missing two fingers. That became influential. Ultimately, I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to vote for Jason. Uh, I love how you talked about playing these songs and how that you, you know, knowing these notes and how they influenced you as well as a kid. Yes. Uh, you I have my guitar how... I can play for you right now. I'm... <laughs> hey, hey, Bobby. You know what I mean? And that's G? Yeah. After, after this match, it's up to Jason. It's up to Jason. <laughs> hey. And, you know, you personalized it with, uh, you said, you know, if you close your eyes, you could hear how the emotional impact of Days of Confused just hits you. Uh, yes. with, with what that song's about. And lastly, you know, driving in your car, listening to the soundtrack of, of Zeppelin. Uh, that was amazing. So thank you. Howard Coletto. Thank you very thank much. You, Howard Our judges, awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you guys for taking notes and listening as well. We appreciate you wholeheartedly. Let's bring in John Red right now and see who, who he votes for and why. Hey, Avi, before I, before I vote, uh, I'd like to ask Joe Rosbristano Res if he could tell me how many – Number one albums did uh, the Black Sabbath have? And also, how many Grammys did they win? At least six number ones from what I have researched, but the Grammys I do not know. Okay. So I'm going to go with Rock Richard. A lot of times in sports and stuff, we talk about the hardware, the championships. That's where, that's what judge, that's what everything's judged on. I'm going to go give my vote to Rock Richards because he did talk about the Grammys, the consecutive uh, number one albums, and all the ticket sales. Uh, three points for Rock Richards in this one. John Red votes for Rock Richards. Let's bring in Pete Sharpie and see who he votes for and why. Hey, everyone. Three great bands that were, like, influential throughout the years. But I believe, you know, and Jason London brought this up, that Led Zeppelin – was very influential, uh, influential with people, not just because, you know, because of music, they were very diverse in their music, which had led more people to like them. But, you know, Jimmy Page, a great guitarist, people loved him and influenced Jason him himself to play guitar. So you go, Jason gets my vote. Jason London gets a vote from Pete Sharpie, guys and gals. Jason London now is in second place to Joe Rosatano. I will read the votes momentarily, but let's bring in more of our judges. Let's bring in... Giselle, who do you vote for and why? Mr. London, I very much enjoy how you are personalizing all of the topics tonight as we are getting to know you. And I 
liked how you started talking about how Led Zeppelin influenced hip hop later in the argument, but it wasn't quite enough for me. Mr. Rizzatano, you gave me a lot of the history of Black Sabbath, how they were formed, but you didn't connect it to what makes them so great overall as a band. Mr. Richards, you gave me the history of the band as well as a lot of their accolades. My vote is going to Mr. Richards this round. Okay, uh, another vote for Rock Richards, guys. I will read what we have now. Jorah Satana with 38 points slash votes. Jason London with 17. Rock Richards with 17. So Rock and Jason are tied. That second place spot, whoever does make it out of this thing in second place will advance along with the first place, but still much more to go. Eric Heron, who do you vote for and why? Talk about three bands that speak to my life. I love each one of them. Sabbath, Zeppelin, Metallica. But we're talking about the greatest metal band of all time, not necessarily the most influential or the most personable. So that being said, there's been no metal band in history to win award after award after award after award as Metallica. There's been no band in history to get number one after number one after number one after number one, after number one like Metallica. They created a sound all of their own. They created a sound that Megadeth followed, that Anthrax followed, that a lot of the metal bands of today, and I, I fact check me if you want, Metallica was 81, Megadeth's 83. Fact check me. I dare you, Joe. I see that look. So that being said, I'm going to say Rock Richards. Three points, my friend. Well done. Eric the Beard Heron votes for Rock Richards. Okay, three points for Rock Richards right now. Let's bring in Megan, see who she votes for and why. If I could do this right here, here we go. So I think that everyone again made really good points. Uh, Joe, I really enjoyed the story because I don't know very much about any of these bands like and their history. I think you also did mention a lot about what they influenced, the different types of metal that they basically created and influenced. Um, Jason London, I really enjoyed the personalization. Again, I really like the story about how you listened to it, how it affected you. Like it was, it was like going on a little bit of a journey, which was really nice. Um, but similar to what Eric said, like I try to, as a judge, pay to it, pay attention to what the round title is, and this round title is greatest metal band of all time, not most influential. And because of that, I also thought that Rock Richards brought up not only the history but then he brought up the actual accolades that the band made. And at the end, he even said that it's the top selling metal band in the past 40 years. And neither of the other gentlemen could rebuke that. And in fact, Joe's rebuttals kind of happened to help Rock's uh, topic a little bit in, in, in bringing them up. So I'm going to go with Rock Richards for this one. Uh, quite the turnover from Metallica early on, of course. Uh, Dave Mustaine getting booted out. Of course, the tragedy that happened to Cliff Burton, one of the greatest of all time. Guys and gals, yeah. uh, you're looking at three amazing debaters. Speaking of great, uh, Jason London, Joe Rosatano, and Rock Richards. So all of your votes now. We're going to pull up all of your votes. And again, two wildcard voters are in the comment section now. Uh, Karen Price and Chad T. Can, superfan. So let's see who you vote for and why as we continue tallying all these votes. Phil says without... Sabbath, there is no heavy metal. Joe has my vote, okay? Cedric's votes for Joe as well. So two points go to Joe Ricitano. Evelyn Hesterly says Joe has my vote. So that's another vote for Joe Ricitano. Julie Hall says, not a metal band enthusiast, but completely on the responses to me, Jason London brought the personal touch, so my vote goes to Jason London. Jason gets a vote, guys and gals. A lot on the line over here. Pride in the prize. Who are the two that will advance to round two? Julie says, my vote goes to Jason London. Music about how it makes you feel. He explained how he closed his eyes and listened to how the music influenced him to feel. Very detailed votes here. We appreciate all of your comments because you guys are not shortchanging anyone. Karen Calabretta votes for Joe. So Joe gets a vote. Mel Red says, my vote is for Jason. He really spoke to me on this topic. Dakota Benson says, everyone knows Joe is the way to go. Joe gets my vote. Okay. Jester Gambit, without Sabbath. We don't have metal at all. Joe gets my vote. Okay. So another vote for Joe. Andrew Red the Fourth votes for Rock Richards. All right. I'm scrolling up here live. A few that I missed. Randy says Rock has my vote. Sunshine says votes got to go to Joe Rosatano on this one. Okay. Mindy votes for Joe as well. 
Chris votes for Rock Richards. Okay. Let's bring up more votes if we can as we are doing this live, guys and gals. Trixie says, I vote Jason with a capital J-A-S-O-N. He's not only a gentleman but a scholar. I love that he's so personable. Not only was Zeppelin on English band, but they were formed in London. There you go. I see what you did yes, there. That's right. <laughs> I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Guys and gals, a lot of great comments. Man, our viewers are so intelligent. I love that. Mary Lloyd says, Joe has my vote. Lola Lloyd. I never know. Why does Lloyd have two L's? we got to discuss Lola that <laughs> Hey, Jason, this is a good chance as any to ask you a question. Yes, sir. Why do certain Gregs have two Gs at the end of their first name? I have. not That's like you just said with that one. I don't know. Does it bother you? I don't know. It's uh, Maybe they have a cousin named Greg, but he, uh, he's like, I'm the one with two Gs. Are they showing he's, off? He's, he's, G with, he's Greg with one G, and I'm Greg with two Gs. Are the, the ones with two Gs bragging? I don't know. It's a possibility. It's a possibility. He's like, hey, I've got one more G than you do, so uh, I get uh, I get ice cream first. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they annoy me is what I'm saying. I'm trying to say that, that. They do annoy me. Uh, guys and gals, again, Jason London and myself, yours truly, Avi Klein, part of an incredible network. Uh, we're going to keep it real and give you a great show. We'll announce that show, Jason and I, in the coming weeks, of course. Uh, Brian Clark is voting. Great storytelling. Sabbath was named MTV's greatest metal band of all time. Joe gets the vote. Mindy McNine votes for Jason London on this one. Lauren Smith votes for Joe. Okay. Adam Jeffrey Hesterly, a lot of syllables there, votes for Joe, who has one syllable and three letters in his name. Uh, we have more. <laughs> Let's see what else we have over here. Rock Richards gets Gus Anselmo's vote. With absolute confidence as a Metallica fanatic, a member of the fifth member community and historian of the band, you hit the nail on the head, my dude. Calling it back to the metal up your well, you know, days was excellence, makes me want to bust out. No life to leather demo. Gus Anselmo votes for Rock <laughs> Richards. Wow. For my eyes. <laughs> Karen Price, with her three points, votes for Joe Risitano. Another one over here, a little lengthy. Sean Stasiak says, Rock Richards had a great story in case made for Metallica of Metallica. Jason had just a great authentic connection and story personal experience with Led Zeppelin, but got to go with Joe on this round, too. He just had a great laid-out history, story, influence, and delivery of why Black Sabbath was slash is the best heavy metal band in history. Ah, yes, he did, Avi. Sean Stasiak votes for <sighs> Thank you. Joe Risitano. A lot of votes here. Uh, let's go more. Let's go more. Uh, Peyton as as Veto votes for Joe. Thank you very much. Hey, Mary hi. votes for Joe. Okay. So guys, Claire Shields also votes for Joe. Eric, thank you for again for telling everything in the back. I know there's a lot. Joe of gets my vote now too. Yeah, I was going to say this is turning yeah. into a battle for second hey, hey. place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Second place gets into that second round. Rock, how how uh, how important is it for you to get into that second round? Pride in the prize. Well, you know, I would have liked to go on out on top of both competitors, but, you know, it's one of them things where, you know, you, you get in any way you can. And, I mean, second place, if that gets me to the dance, hey, I'll, I'll take it, you know. Rock Richards I mean, there. There's you a guys lot on the line here. Been on the green room for such a long time. Mindy McNine Red, Speedy Klein, thank you, auctioneer. Nah, I don't really want to do that. I do like the guy in Storage Wars if he's still around. Okay, Fred Altman says, Joe, <laughs> great job, Joe. That's not a vote, but thank you, Fred Altman, for joining us. Davis Jubilee votes for Rock Richards. Joe Satano, it's not the time to rebut me, please. Oh, no, 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 Gina no. Marie is adding seven Greg, seven Gs to the name Greg. Oh, Thank no. You so much for that. Uh, I think we're done. Kara J votes for Jason London. Jason London gets another vote. And Jason Cox votes for Rock Richards. So two straight votes. Bob Cook, although Led Zeppelin is my favorite, I vote for Rock based on how the debate was presented. Thank you, Bob, for that comment. We appreciate that wholeheartedly. Uh, we are now going for Chad and his three points. All I can say is... Joe just nailed so many facts and knowledge about Black Sabbath. I think he almost covered everything and hit on his rebuttal. But Metallica and Zeppelin are amazing bands, and both Rock and Jason fought hard. But I'm voting for Joe. I'm a Judas Priest fan. Aren't we all? And I appreciate the vote. <laughs> yes. Points. Go to Joe. Johnny McKinney votes for Rock Richards. So many votes over here. Jeff Reeder votes for Jason London on this one. And Cheryl Riley also votes for Jason London on this topic, guys and gals. Uh, I think we have a few more, and then we'll move on to the last round, guys. We're almost out of here with this particular debate. Right now, we are at... 59 for Joe Rosatano, 31 for Rock Richards, 23 for Jason London, but we're not done. We are not done, guys and gals. Not by a long shot. Uh, get ready for topic number three. Yeah. All right, let's do that. So, guys, this is the way it's going to go. Jason London will begin this topic. We're rotating things every round. Joe will go second. Rock will go third. And let me read to you this third and final topic, guys. Right now, our third topic is famous last words. There's something... There's something powerful about reading famous last words, not because of the men or women who might have said them simply because of their status, but 
why it resonated with us. Yeah, these men and women were well known and successful in life as writers, politicians, athletes, artists, and more. But though they have legacies that are larger than life, the one thing they all share that everybody eventually shares is death. What do you say to sum up a life well lived? Some choose funny words, others more serious. Some are obscure. Princess Diana's last words were tragic, while Steve Jobs' last words were debated. Like reading Life is Short quotes on life quotes filled with wisdom, famous last words remind us that life is indeed short, and we have to make the most of our time. These people made sure to make one more lasting impression on the world before they left it. But which of these words resonate with us most and why? Jason London will make a case for why Leonard Nimoy's A Life is Like a Garden is so very impactful. When Jason is finished, we'll move over to Joe Rossitano, who will make a case for Benjamin Franklin's last words, a dying man could do nothing easy. And then to wrap it up, Rock Richards will make a case for why Bob Marley's last words, money can't buy life, is so very impactful. Mr. London, are you ready? Uh, yes, sir, I think. In a three, in a two, in a you. Uh, yeah, man. Well, I mean, first off, to 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 be sort of cognizant of the of the sort of reality and the, the they finally face the the fact that it's right around the corner and you're about to that you're probably about to to die and and to sort of be reflective and look back on what your life is and to be able to I think it's a beautiful words that life is like a garden because I mean if you think about it on a just a base level of of you know ashes to ashes dust to dust dirt to dirt you know that kind of thing is you need you can't have garden without a dirt and you can't have a garden without a seed you can't have a life without a seed and and you can't have hold on there sorry uh you yeah you can't have life without a seed to start that life and uh, how beautiful your garden is depends on um how beautiful you treat it and how beautiful you love it and how beautiful you take care of it and i think that that has very much to do with the, uh, us on a personal level whether it's dealing with addictions or whether it's dealing with um you know emotional issues or whatever it might be it's a uh, to us to cultivate what the uh, final outcome is and um you know do you want just a little herb garden or do you want like one of those really big beautiful gardens with stalks of corn and and every kind of pepper on the planet like my brother has my, my twin brother jeremy is the best gardener i've ever seen and he's got it, uh, there's so much life uh, to it and when you realize that a garden is something that is alive and it's something that is dependent on you the same way that um the seed makes a child and the seed makes uh, the vegetables and whatever it is uh the fruits and everything um how important that that you cultivate that garden always you know i remember um going out and picking the snap peas with my grandma and my grandpa, you know, they were, you know, to me, they were really old back there when I was little, and the joy that we got <laughs> out of, uh, as a family, all picking, picking the, the green beans together and, um, you know, getting to be on the, <clears throat> on the tractor with, with grandpa, whenever, uh, whenever he would till the garden or whenever he would till the fields and all that, and, you know, me and being a twin, you know, I was always on one side of him and Jeremy was always on the other side of him. And grandma would make us all little uh, pack lunches to go out and, you know, to get to drink soup from a, a hot thermos, you know, you get to act like grandpa with his coffee. And so to me, it yeah. really, it's a nostalgic thing. You know, I grew up with gardens and gardening and uh, uh, it's just the perfect, it's a perfect metaphor for, for, for true life. I mean, it starts from the dirt and it start, goes to a seed and it goes to the growth. And it depends on how uh, how you cultivate it, how much you love it, uh, on how it grows. And that's that. From the heart, I just want to say this to Jason and to everyone here uh, competing. Thank you. Because you guys are lending us your heart and your soul and your mind. And you're doing it live. And I really <laughs> appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, appreciate that. That was a good one. That was a good one. Thank you for giving me that. Like that. <laughs> no problem, Mr. Jason London, who has, of course, given us his final topic. Uh, right now, guys and gals, Famous Last Words is the final topic. We kick it over to Mr. Joe Ricitano, who, again, will follow Jason London. Joe will make a case for why Benjamin Franklin's last words, a dying man can do nothing easy, is so very impactful. Are you ready, Joe? I am ready, sir. In a three, in a two, and a... Gonna... 
change my lighting real quick. I, uh, in researching this, you think so superficially of some people sometimes, like Ben Franklin creating the Franklin stove, making better ventilation for a stovetop, or Ben Franklin creating the lightning rod and how that even works with electricity. But then when you find out that Ben Franklin was someone that had to think outside of the box and make himself into someone more desirable to other people, not just this American innovator that was someone who maybe the technically best capitalist would think to themselves, that's the best life. That's a man that he created all these inventions or maybe at least he was known for his support of the Declaration of Independence, even though he had his haters as well with his Pennsylvania Gazette and even writing satires as other people to get his points across, kind of like you're saying, oh, you know, uh, well, this person said this about you and you're thinking, really? Or did you just make that up? And he would do that <laughs> through the means of uh, other monikers. But then when you find out that he used his influence as this American icon to meet with people in France, specifically one Madame Brion, who was able to get him in with her connections and her enjoyment of this personality of Ben Franklin and how he had a, a strange and quick wit. <laughs> he had this way where through her, he was able to meet with several other diplomats, which at this time was a big deal. And this was around 1778, where he was able to, through her, gain influence into a very gate-kept area where someone else was even sent from the British, Lord Stormont, to be a, a kind of a monkey in the wrench for Ben Franklin's plans to be this diplomat and spread that if you don't know us, you can't judge us as Americans and be able to gain peace treaties with France so that they would also make sure that England couldn't affect them as highly or support any of their military efforts. So from that, which is a giant deal in its own, it's a 70, he was able to make, the Treaty of Alliance through 1778 and 1783 was finally able to have the Treaty of Paris, which recognized America, North America specifically, as a place of its own and also give the respect to that in trades as well. But then finally, the big one that puts over the saying, a dying man can do nothing easy, is that in the last months of his life, Ben Franklin fought against slavery, didn't get to abolish it, but fought against it to make the point to give people who were debased by their position and were finally free for those who were the education and the resources to be people, to be able to hone their intelligence, to learn, to feel like just normal people and vote and live their lives. And as much as in that time, he was faced by tons of opposition. In fact, he was told by one of the Jacksons that I believe it was James Jackson, who was very much for slavery at the time, that he was senile and an old fool for trying to go into abolishing slavery. And especially at this time with the cause of the 1790s he was at his odds but he at least got it pushed over to where it would be discussed even though i will say he did publish an article as a muslim dignitary in that moment to push his point over because ben franklin just can't let people have the last word whatsoever he put out that a dying man can do nothing easy and as much of a force as he was 
he was still at odds with himself and others. Thank you. And he was quite the ladies' man, wasn't he? The old America's Benny. founding flirt. <laughs> Benny Franklin. Yeah, good old Benny Franklin mm. was absolutely quite the flirt, sure. Guys and gals, Rock Richards will have the final word right now. Famous last words. And this is also the last topic that will be debated. And the last individual debating the last topic will be Rock Richards, who will be making a case for why Bob Marley's last words, money can't buy life, is so very impactful. Rock, are you ready? In a three, in a two, in a you. Well, Avi Klein, you know, Scripture tells us that we're all born into sin, but the reality of the situation is we're all born into debt. I mean, from the day that you're born, your mother and father get a bill in the mail. From the time you cultivate this young mind and you send them to school, they're learning. And the reason why they're learning is to eventually possibly to go off to high school, maybe even college preparing them for what they're going to do for the rest of their life as their career. And so many things I've heard it said that money is the root of all evil, but money is an inanimate object. Money is a mechanism. Money transports your work and your greatest efforts into the future. So you work today, you get paid next week. Your, your work ha can itself cannot last longer than the day. So money is the conduit of man's desires. It's, it's the way that we obtain the things that we want. And we spend our lives. We sacrifice our time. We sacrifice our family. We sacrifice our own health <coughs> working to obtain all the things that we want. But in those final moments, when the end is near, when that cold, dark blackness stares you in the eyes and you look behind you and you realize that all your stuff is in the past. When you're laying in that hospital bed and you're amassing a debt, all that money that you saved that you thought you were going to do these great things with, it goes right back into the system. In fact, a lot of life itself is almost like financial slavery. This is what you dedicated your entire life to doing. But once the end is near, it's only then that you realize where the true value is. The once held value in this money is no more. And you realize that the one and only thing that you would trade every red cent you had for is more life. However, all the money in the world isn't going to buy you an extra breath. Real value, guys. I teach a I teach a storytelling workshop. Joe, of course, is part of the Friday workshop. I gotta say, before and after. After this moment, I'll look back at what we're doing now live and appreciate all three men for what they've given us through all three topics. That is the place that I call my heart because it comes from there. And I appreciate Jason London, Joe Rissitano, and Rock Richards because again, it's great to see individuals from different walks of life, different levels of experience, different objectives all come together to have fun and discuss topics that hopefully are meaningful, thought-provoking, thought provoking, and fun as well. Of course, Jason, Rock, and Joe did just that, which means now, guys and gals, it's all up to you. Who advances to round number two? This is a competition. Pride in the prize. You heard Jason, you heard Joe, and you heard Rock. They all want to win this thing. 13 grand, nothing to sneeze at. Trip for two to Greece, five days, five nights. And of course, the pride of calling yourself Mr., Mrs., or Miss TKN, depending on who wins this. So with that, let's bring in Howard Collado, and you will let us know who you vote for in this final round and why. Joe, I could appreciate the, the homework you did behind uh, your, your argument. Um, and Brock, you know, the quote also spoke to you, and you also made some great points. But my vote's going to go to Jason, and the reason being is that, Jason, you really connected the dots with the kind of the cyclical nature of life and how the garden becomes like this beautiful metaphor for our own life and how you have to cultivate it in order for us to have an enriching life. So you really connected that. And I could tell there's something else that felt very, very emotional about as well. So yes, yes. vote goes to uh, Jason. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Collado. Thank you very much. Three points for Jason London, guys and gals. Let's bring in Pete Sharpie. Everyone made some great points. You know, Rock, you got me with born into debt. 
that had me thinking, you know, money is the root of all evil. Sacrifices are always made for money. And you can't take money to the grave. You can't. But, I never thought I'd hear you say those words, though. That's what's interesting <laughs> to me, right? <laughs> I, was, I was born into money. It's something different. That's, that's different. That's I digress. Different. We're, all, we're all not like me, Avi. That's right, true. Joe, great history on Ben Franklin, you know, and uh, Leonard Nimoy, Jason. What he Life is like a garden. Very profound statement. You brought up good points. A garden without seeds is not a garden. Uh, can't have life without a seed. Life needs to be cultivated, which is very profound statements. These are, you know, it, it, it hits differently. It hits you in the heart. And my vote goes to Jason. Money don't buy, doesn't buy eternity. Cecilia, thank you very much. Uh, Jason London gets three more points, guys and gals. Pete Sharpie has voted and has made it known that he's voting for Mr. Jason London. Okay. We're tallying all of that in the back. John Red, who do you vote for and why? Great job, every one of you, man. Y'all really put it together, and it really makes my job hard on this last round. <laughs> I'm going to go to Jason London. I, too, grew up around gardens, and you brought back a memory to me of my grandfather. This brought it back, this brought it back for me, too. I was so <laughs> glad to get to actually do that. Being down on my hands and knees and my grandmother showing me how to plant the seeds, um, and, and that's why I'm going to give you my three points. John Thank Red, you. guys and gals, again, speaking from an honest place, from the heart. There is no more honest place, uh, hopefully, than the human heart. Let's bring in uh, Megan, and let, she'll let us know who she's voting for in this final round and why. Again, fantastic job, gentlemen, all of you. Um, I would say this entire time, uh, Jason, you've been you know, speaking from your heart and talking about how things resonate with you, and this particular topic really did resonate. As someone who also grew up, my dad was a gardener. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, I definitely can relate to that, uh, as well as many other parts of my life, which go back to this, but tend to your garden. So I'm going to give these points to Jason. Jason London, guys and gals, gets a vote from Megan. Uh, very good. So, guys, we right now are going to read you where things stand officially. We now, as we check this tally, have Joe Rosatano at 59 points, Jason London at 35 points, Rock Richards at 31 points. Top two advance, guys and gals. Thank you, Megan, again. Uh, let's bring in Giselle. Are you ready? I'm always ready, Mr. Klein. Very good. Especially because I'm Kate. Gentlemen. Are you? Are you? Are you? More on that later. More on that. <laughs> which, speaking of which, guys and gals, second half of our show. You know what we do. Don't go anywhere. We blur lines. Keep it up here after the debate, guys and gals, as yet another genre of the green room will appear before you as we blur those lines honestly and openly. Go ahead, Giselle. If you insist, very well then. Mr. Rosatano, I very much enjoyed the delving into the history and accomplishments of one Mr. Franklin. I would have liked to have heard a little bit more of a connection between all of those accomplishments and his dying words, you were getting there right at the end, but it wasn't quite enough. Mr. Richards, you had very solid points in explaining how those dying words affected both Mr. Marley's life and our life throughout. Mr. London, as someone who did not grow up with a garden, I felt your passion. I felt your points of the personalization really worked for you in this round, cultivating and letting it grow and coming from someone such as Leonard Nimoy just makes that all the more impactful for what he stood for and what he meant. My vote goes to Mr. London in this round. Mr. Jason London gets three more points, guys and gals. So again, 59 for Joe. Jason has 35. Is it 38 now? Yeah, it's 38. And Rock has 31. So go, just like that, Jason Lennon, Jason, how do you feel? You were down by about nine points. Now, as it stands, if we're done at this point, which we're not, you'll also be in the second round. Your thoughts? Um, uh, that's great. It's really cool. I, I, I think I got a, a pretty lucky with uh, getting to sort of uh, talk talk about uh, the, the, the comparison of life in a garden. And so for me, that was kind of easy. I actually ran a, had a lyric in a song at one point that said, I tried to water that garden, but it died too soon. So it's like it kind of reminded me of, 
you know, of ha having to be responsible for, if you treat yourself the way you would a garden, you know, some people can't grow a flower, which I'm sure. kind of <laughs> bad about it myself. But, there wasn't you know, a lot of personal. I can, I can grow some beans and some potatoes. I could do that. I, I could I could use some carbs and some starch after the show, guys and gals. I haven't eaten, but you did personalize, which is why I found this is making me hungry. About. Yeah, guys and gals, <laughs> we're gonna bring in Eric. I am. I got all this garden talk. I want to eat. Uh, Eric Karen, guys and gals, is gonna be up here next and voting for either Jason London, Rock Richards, or Joe Rosatano. Talk to you about that later. Um, <laughs> Listen, I I was entranced by both Mr. London and Mr. Richards. Joe, your your history on Mr. Franklin being what it is. Awesome, awesome history lesson on Mr. Franklin. But as somebody said earlier, I couldn't connect the dots to his last words, how they were very influential. And it was a toss up between you two. It really, really was because, Rock, you're 100 percent right. We're born in debt. We die in debt. You know, I wish you would have said, you know, when you die, your family takes over that debt because they really do. And then it just keeps going. It's cyclic, cyclical. But that brings me to Mr. London. We are a garden. That's what life is. You're, you're, you're the seed. You sprout. And then they put you in the ground, ashes to ashes and such. So that being said, gentlemen, this was an excellent, excellent debate tonight. Mr. London, I thank you for coming out and joining hey, us. And uh and looking forward to you joining the network. Rock, man, it's always great to see you. But tonight, I got to go, Jason London, at the very, very Yeah, nice. I think we got the sweep there a little bit. Hmm. Yeah, Eric Heron, guys, mm -hmm. votes for Jason London. Was it a sweep of judges voting for Jason? Uh, perhaps. Let's look right now at the tally because Joe's at 59. Oh, that's right, Joe. Yeah, he's kidding. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're, fight. we're fighting for second place yeah, here. Yeah. One second, Joe. <laughs> Jason, uh, there's no rebuttal, my friend. We are done. Oh, no, no, it's not that. It's about the review show. You're already up. You're up by no, 75 no, no. points and you still want to rebut somebody? <laughs> no, I have two points from review show. Look at this. Look at this. You're up by 96 points. <laughs> greedy. Didn't you hear all that stuff about not taking money to the grave? You greedy. See, life's a, life's a garden, man. Yeah. Life's like a garden. <laughs> and I got to cultivate back. now. You, you got to dig it. <laughs> enjoy your 61 points and eat a baked potato. Do me a favor. Guys, Joe Ricitano <laughs> is at 61 points. Jason London not too far behind with 42 rock Richards with 31. It is not over guys. It is not over. Let's find out how this thing goes. Remember the, the way the brackets work, because this is sort of an NCAA style elimination tournament. There are two spots open in round two, which means that even though we've had a bevy of those who've lost mm -hmm. Todd Bridges has lost a lot of credible individuals. Ken Patera, us Olympian. We're still going to have a matchup that will allow two who've lost to get a chance to come back in for round number two, one more time, sort of like a last resort to get back in this thing that'll only happen after round one so we'll see how things happen to advance tonight i concur absolutely christopher all three men did well and this was such a hard topic by my vote goes to jason he spoke from the heart and therefore made the better argument jason gets my vote another vote for jason london jaleesa says i miss todd guys todd and i have a show called way of the world as you know as part of the 60 shows on this network todd did great against Stephen tobolowski maybe he'll be back in this tournament who knows sunshine says my vote is for rock richards this time great delivery love jason's quote as well though absolutely absolutely uh rock richards jason london and joe i'm glad i'm not voting you guys were awesome so julie votes for jason london okay got that bubba brewer thank you for joining us jason gets my vote and Mindy Froley, I vote for Jason this time. My dad grew a huge garden when I was a kid, and it brought back so many memories. So, of course, Jason London, of course, what he described to a T resonated with the masses. We appreciate all of you being honest about that. Bob says, I vote for Jason as well. More votes to Jason. Brian Clark, really enjoyed Jason's storytelling. That brought back great memories for me personally, and I see you down there voting for him as well. So another vote for Jason London. And Randy Pritchard votes for Rock Richards. Jason Cox votes for Rock Richards. Two more votes for Rock. Blake Cabanis votes for Jason London. And Jeff Reeder votes for Jason London. As does Hauser Odelock. I vote for Mr. London. A beautiful balance between personalization and philosophical implications of the quote. Thank you, Hauser Odelock. Dakota Benson says, Jason gets my vote. I felt his words so deeply. Excellent debate. Jason, Rock, and Joe, starting with Jason. 
Uh, really quick, what do you think of our viewers? Huh? So much passion, huh? This is great to see. Wonderful. Yes. Yeah, I, I love it. It's incredible, uh, intelligent responses, and uh, you can tell that they're really listening and paying attention. It's really fantastic. 100%. Very attentive, yeah. Jaleesa says Jason made great points, so another point slash vote goes to Mr. Jason London. Let's scroll up and see what else we have over here, because this right now is the 11th hour. It's the final topic that will determine who advances and who does not. Jester Gambit says, I gotta go Jason London. I vote for Jason. I'm... Um, Cliffhanger. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Julie Hall says, great topics. Great points from all gentlemen. Difficult, but vote goes to Jason London. Heartfelt answers. Another vote for Jason London. Sean Stasiak. Let me take a deep breath. Wow, deep reality perspective from Mr. Richards. Appreciate the deep insight and message. Truly, Joe, with another tutoring history lesson, just as well laid out and delivered. So thank you, Joe. But Jason won my heart and vote on this one. Just really felt personal experience and storyline and emotional, authentic connection he had with me throughout the screen. Congratulations to all gentlemen. You all did really well. Thank you. And Sean, I am not making fun of your comments. I am simply trying to read them because they are intelligent and it's not like long-winded. You do not short changes. Thank you very much. And you did vote for Jason on this one. He did win your heart, as you said. So Jason London gets yet another vote. Very good. Uh, we have more, 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 and more. John Red. No, I think I got your vote already. Who do we have here? Chad. I won't make a speech, LOL, but I vote for Jason this round. Great job, gentlemen. Thank you, Chad. Thank you so much for all of your votes. Three points because Chad is our wild card voter. Gus Anselmo says, very tough to go this round. I'm going to say I respect the Jason London's points the most here. With his efforts, he put all above and beyond impressive this round. This is the first time I had voted someone different all three rounds. Who are you voting for? I didn't get the vote. I guess you're voting Jason London, but I, I did not not officially. Trixie Mitchelson says, I vote Jason. Gus, you were so you were right close, right to just saying who you're voting for. All right, who else do we got? We got Stella Castellano. Man, I really almost teared up when Jason presented his points. Absolutely. Very heartfelt and honest. My vote goes to Jason. I cannot have these shades on my face after this this round. I can't do these men a disservice. It's hard. Uh, let's see. My vote goes for Jason, according to Jalisa. Hope you get it. I did get it right now, so we are going to tally that. Thank you so much for that. As we keep this thing going, Cecilia, Jason, voting for him, speaking from his heart. Okay, really cool. I think we're just about done. I, I believe we're done. So I'm going to see if I missed anything. I don't believe I did. Let me read you the final tally. Oh, my God. This is incredible. So get this. Jason London with 64 points in the lead. Joe Rosatano with 61. And Jason, if you click private chat, you can tally all these, man. They're right here. 64 <laughs> points. You, you killed this round, essentially. You got a ton of them. <laughs> That's crazy. That's Jason come London, from behind who was in, in, in third place. That means anything could happen in this tournament. As you can see, we're counting them fairly, guys. This is live. Yes. You see the names That's pop very up. Cool. Wow. Jason guys, London was you guys, third. You guys, Jason amazing, was man. That's, you guys are amazing. So I, I, I didn't think I had a chance in it. That's great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to count things down and make it official, guys. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, Five, four, three, two, and a one. <laughs> Guys and gals, with a grand total of 64 points, Jason London is the top <laughs> vote getter and will advance to round number two of the Celebrity Grand Debate Tournament featuring over 10 Hall of Famers, Oscar winners, and of course, Academy Awards.